at John chapter 6, verses 35 through 40. Um, if you didn't bring your Bible and you want to follow along with me, it's 866 on the few Bibles. You can open it up and turn there. Um, and what a great way. What a, what a way to come in and to be able to rejoice over Connor and make a life-changing decision of, of accepting Christ in his life. You know that? We haven't done that since before COVID. We haven't baptized anybody in that long. And, and man, it just, just makes my heart full over joy for that decision. And I just, um, I'm just really excited about what God's going to do in his life. You know, I just got through preaching through the book of Romans uh, just a couple weeks ago. And I know I'm going to go over to the book of Daniel and preach through it. I want to preach one chapter and then preach something else. And then preach one chapter and then preach something else. And, you know, just kind of on them. I, I really wanted to um, just really pray over this and you know, Easter's right around the corner, it's about six weeks away, and, and just praying. And then last week as I was going through one of my devotionals, um, I read one about I am the gate, the door. Jesus said that. And really got me started thinking. I started going back and looking. There's seven I am statements in the Gospel of God. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to preach through these I am statements up until Easter. And I just think that that's... Um, it just really, I was led that way. So this week I am talking about Jesus being the bread of life. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And so that's where we're going to be in John chapter 6, 30, 35 through 40. So if you will, please stand as I read God's word. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me, will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I will lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Please pray Lord, Heavenly Father, just thank you for everything we've got to do today. Thank you for being able to sing songs of praises and worship, lifting you up in, in those songs. Lord, being able to go to you in, um, in communion, be able to take that, just doing in the remembrance of your Son. But we know just how great of a joy it is to see Connor being baptized in the decision that he made in his life. Lord, just thank you allowing us to be part of that. But we know it's in your son's name that we do this. Amen. You may be seated. You know what? Like I said, the Bible records statements made by Jesus referring to him as the I am. Um, in Greek, it's actually one word. It's E-I-M-I. -I. Remember how you want to pronounce that? That's how it's spelled. Which simply means I am. It can also be translated uh, it is I. Like in some passages like John 40. Uh, 426, Jesus said unto her, I who speak to you am he. In John 620, it says, But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. John 824 says, Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. And in John 858, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. So Jesus referred to himself in these passages by using that Old Testament. Uh, name for God, I am. That's where that's where we're seeing this. And I think it's important that that we understand the context of these statements where Jesus is speaking and He's saying, "I am, I am the promised Messiah, I am God," because He was God in human form. He, he came to provide redemption for our fallen humanity. You didn't realize Christ was special. I mean, there's a lot of people in the Bible back in those days. That realize that? There's a lot today that realize that. But most people, well, most of them fail to see him as the, as the Christ. I think these I am statements have a purpose in the Bible. It is to reveal himself as the Christ. He wanted them to see him as the Savior and re, re, uh, the Redeemer. He came for our salvation. He came to provide a sacrifice for our sins. 
And when you look at these been about 2,000 years ago, but I really believe that these I am statements of Jesus really, really hold great significance. I, I believe that, that you know, Jesus was a historical person. He did go to die on the cross. But as I said, many stop short of seeing who Christ really is as Savior of the world because he did die for our sins. Like I said, over the next few weeks, we're going to look at these statements recorded in the gospel. Today, we're going to look at Jesus being the bread of life. I really got three points that I'm going to, that I'm going to talk about, uh, three points that I want us to see as, as I go through these scriptures of, of what Jesus said. The first one is, in being the bread of life, you see Jesus' identity is defined. He, his identity is defined. What we discover in verses 35 and 36 when Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I say to you, that you have seen me and yet do not believe. So we look at these and the first thing that Jesus says is, I am. I am. Jesus, Jesus is, is really saying, I am God. He is affirming his power. He is affirming who he really is. And he says, I am. Man, we're going to see this, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, I am the door, the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the way, and I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true vine. Jesus, when he says these I am, he is affirming his deity. He is affirming who God is. You know, I really think it takes us back to Exodus 3.14 when, when Moses is standing in, in, with the burning bush and God is telling that he needs to go back to his people and, and deliver them out of their slavery with the Egyptians and, and take them. And, and Moses asked the question, who should I say sent me? And this is what God says unto Moses. He says, I am that I am. I am before the creation of the world. I am the one who sustains the world. I am the one who brings salvation. I am the one who has justification. I am. That's what God is saying. I am. And, and, and so we see that Jesus is proclaiming his deity. In Revelation 1 8, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, which is which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So Jesus is saying, I am. I am God. I was there before the foundation. I was there before creation. I am the one who sustains the world. He is putting himself equal with God. He is God in human form. So we have to see Jesus as God. I think that's so important in our Christian faith, in our Christian walk, that we see him as God. Not just some other God, but as God, equal to God. And because of who he is, because he is God, he can provide. We look at the second part of verse 35. It says, he who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. The multitude was, was really seeking physical bread. That the only thing that can sustain them. You know, this is, if you read this story and go back to the beginning of, it, of this chapter, we're going to see that Jesus fed the 5,000. We see that, that, that he walked on water and went to the boat. <coughs> and then at this point in time, the people knew that Jesus was coming to shore. And they ran to meet him there at that boat. Because why? Because they wanted food. They knew that he could provide it. He just did it not too long ago. And they're, and they're looking to be fed again. They're looking to, to get, to get uh, their thirst relieved again. You know, you go to the, to the Old Testament, we see that God provided manna and food for the Israelites when they was in the wilderness. He provided water for them while they were there. And so the people had that same mindset. But Jesus, Jesus is on a different level. You know, he says, listen, what I give you, you'll never thirst again. And what I give you, you'll never hunger again. I will provide that for you. You're looking for physical, but I'll definitely give you spiritual. And you can, will never hunger, and you will never thirst again spiritually. Man, there are many people like that today that want Jesus, that want heaven, that wants that, wants that, wants what Jesus can give them that they don't want to give their life to him. They don't want to, they don't want to come up and say, yes, I want Jesus, I want to make you my Savior. I want to confess my sins. I want to repent from the world, and I want you to be my master, and I'll be your servant. 
But they want that, but they want that all the glory, all the heaven, and all the other stuff that Jesus can offer. They don't want what it really takes to make Jesus Lord. People, you know, we kind of look at these people here and we kind of condemn them sometimes and thinking, man, I can't believe that they didn't see that. But man, there are so many people in this world that are the same way. Only Jesus can change. Only Jesus can provide a way to an eternal life. You know what? Jesus offers the ultimate satisfaction in our life. In verse 36, he says, By saving you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. So these people that did not accept, that's a problem that we have. Jesus knew the desires of their hearts. He knew their intentions. They were more than happy to receive the benefits he provided. They were unwilling to submit to him as Lord. And that fundamental truth has not changed either. Because people try to satisfy their life with other things in the world. Whether it's drugs or alcohol or sex. Or maybe, maybe you try to fill that void with your job. Maybe it's, you try to fill the void with your hobbies or, or, or maybe even your family. And you try to make that, try to make that to make you whole through something like that. But let me tell you what, most of those things are gone. Guess what? You still have a hole that needs to be satisfied. Jesus fills that gap. He fills that void. And that's what he does. And, and, and he says, listen, even though you see me and you hear me, you do not believe in me. Because we cannot make it on our own. The ones who try to get there on their own, you know, that's what Jesus is talking about. You, you see me, you know me, but you're still going to try to make it on your own. You cannot do it. We're never good enough. Not, not a single thing that we do in our life can get us there. It's through Jesus Christ. He is the source of our salvation. There's no other way to be forgiven and inherit eternal life. Jesus is the defining factor in our life. He's the one who fills the void. He is God. And he went to the cross for our sins. We have to recognize and accept him as Lord if we want to be saved. Second thing I want us to see, in being the bread of life, we see Jesus' authority is declared. We see his authority is declared in verses 37 and 38. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have not come down from heaven, not, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So we see that death. There, there, there must be a draw. You know, that... Right there in the start of verse 37, it says, All that Father gives me shall come to me. And Jesus speaks of those whom the Father has given him. And he speaks of those who come to him. He, he said that there has to be a drawing. Uh, we, that if you are to be saved and receive the bread of life, there must be that, that drawing to God. The Holy Spirit inspires that. And, and, there's a, uh, and you have to come to him. If you go down to verse 44, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on that last day. Man, there has to be that working of the Holy Spirit. We get, we look in, in, in Revelations chapter 3, verse 20, and Jesus says, Behold, I stand and knock at the door. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, and he will dine with me, and I will dine with him. There is a drawing. You know, I, I read an illustration, an article about two guys who were climbing up the face of a mountain. And one guy made it to the summit, and the other guy's rope kind of slipped. And he was dangling, hanging on to the edge of the cliff. And the other guy lowers a rope down and says, grab this rope, and I'll pull you up. The guy has a choice, right? Either he can grab that rope and be saved, or he can not grab that rope and he's going to fall. That's the same with what God does to us. He says, here is my son. If you accept him, believe in him, and make him more, then you have life. So decide not to make that decision. And choose the world, then there is death. That's what it's about. That's what, that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is offering up life, giving water, giving bread. Once again, we see that people are looking for things to satisfy them. Jesus is the only one who can provide what we need. And his provision 
is eternal. The Lord deals with our hearts and draws us towards the Savior. See, we have good intentions. There are people out there who, who have good intentions, who say, well, you know what, I, 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 maybe not right now, I want to live my life. And I, I know that, that in the end I can, I can make that profession to be okay. You know, I understand Christ is and, and what he has to do, and I feel a drawing, but you know, I, I'm not ready for that. I'm going to live my life. Well, you know what? Hell is full of people with good intentions. Amen. I want to make that last minute proclamation of faith, and I believe in that, okay? And I believe at any time when you call to God and ask him to change your life, and you repent of your sins, that, that it happens. And that sometimes, far too happen, far too often, things happen before you get able to make that decision. If you are unwilling to do business with God when He's dealing with your heart, what makes you think that, that He'll be willing to work with you when you're ready? You know? And I think that I think we have to do that. We cannot leave God out of the salvation process. Why? Because we have an assurance. As a child of God, listen, in, in, in the last part of verse 37. He says, and the one who comes to me, I certainly not cast out. I will certainly not cast out. Can, can, you, can you hear that? Do you, do you understand what Jesus is saying? Jesus says that the one who comes to me will receive and enjoy the benefit that he affords. He offers much more than physical bread to those who believe. What a promise we have as a child of God. And Jesus said, those who come to me will never be cast out. Will never, there's nothing, there's not enough demons in hell to pull you out of my hands because it's about me. It's about my, what I have done for you. There will never be a day when you're asked to leave the presence of God. There will never be a time when he fails to care for us. There will be a circumstance that he's never able to provide for us. This assurance is because of his obedience. Clearly those present that they had not grasped the enormity of this, of this encounter that they had with Jesus. Verse 38 says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus, you know what? Calvary has not even happened yet. He has not gone to the cross yet. And he is saying, I know where I got to go. I know what I have to do. My life ends on the cross to die for your sins, to die for you, to take your place, your punishment for every single one of us in this world. Not for those who just accept him, but for every person in this world. Man, he was being obedient. Follow what you want me to do, I will do. You know, he could have called down legions of angels to take him off that cross. You know, he could have never even went to the cross. He could have done what he wanted to because he was God. And he decided, you know what, I'm going to be obedient. That's why we can have that assurance. That's why we can, we can, we can have that. Last thing I want to see, in being the bread of life, we see that Jesus' reliability is defended. His reliability is defended. Verses 39 and 40. He says, this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he might have given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on that last day. Man, Jesus reveals the matchless power that's associated with our salvation. We really see our preservation. Once again, Jesus is speaking of the will of his Father, that he had come to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins. We are saved through his power. I'll tell you what. I bet it isn't up to me to keep myself saved. If it was up to me to keep myself saved, I would be a failure. Because you know God sees us all the same. We're all sinners in God's eyes. There's not a single one of us who, 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 can, who can get our way there. I mean, the most godly, from the most godly person to the most it is person there is alive. God looks at us all the same. There's not a single one of us that's any different than anybody else. Um, just because I'm a pastor doesn't make me better or worse. It, it makes me the same. And God looks at us that way. He looks at every single one of us like that. And we're all failures. Every
every single one of us. There's nothing that we can do. And I am grateful for His grace and mercy in my life because I know where my destination would be without Christ. No doubt about it. I can't do that. None of us can. Not a single one who has come to Christ, though, will be lost. No doubt the followers of Jesus have wondered about their security in Him as He died upon the cross. You know, He rose from the grave. When He rose from the grave, you know, He has victory over death. He has victory over sin. And, and you know, he, he has victory over that bondage that, was, that, uh, that holds us. And when we we have that same victory, that same power that raised him from the, from the grave also raised us. 1 Peter 1, 5 says, We who are kept by the power of God through faith until salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We are kept by the power of God. And his reliability will lead to our salvation. Long before Jesus ever walked upon this earth and formed a man, sin entered our heart. I, I talked about that at the communion a little bit about Adam and that sin coming into, into this world. And, and you know, and that fails our hearts. And, and that sin that, that we have we're born into. You know, we don't teach our kids to lie, but they end up doing that, don't they? It's that sin nature that we have in our life. And Jesus is the one that overcomes that sin when we come to him. Man, I tell you what, I love Romans 6.23. It's part of the, you know, that Roman, that Roman walk when you when you're laying out the plan of salvation. We use Romans 6.23 a lot. And, and we say that the ways of the sin is death, which is truth, because our sin in our life is, is, is death. You know? That's what we have is death. But we don't always finish the rest of that verse. And it says that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, the wages of sin is death. But because of Jesus Christ, we do not die. We live forever. We don't stand condemned in front of the Almighty God who is holy and just. Everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life. That's what Jesus promises. You know what the greatest thing is, though? We're going to see Him at the day of resurrection. You know, we... At that day when Jesus comes back, whether we're dead or we're alive, we're going to be called up into a rapture with Jesus Christ. And we'll be resurrected in a new body. We'll be resurrected in a new place, a new Jerusalem, no longer on this earth. What a glorious day that will be. Connor be in that group today, right? He made that decision. How can you not rejoice and just think about the greatness that we, that we, even though we don't deserve it, one day will be called up into, into, into heaven. We're going to be there with Christ at that point in time. Man. In Revelation, or 1 Corinthians 15, Satisfies our need and sustains us for all eternity. 
I pray that each one here has, has made that decision to receive Him as their bread of life, that, that you're trusting solely on Him through your repentance and faith for salvation. That's the decision that Connor made. A life-changing, life-altering decision. And I pray as a church that we gather around Him, that we help Him through that, Mom and Dad, has a, there's a Christian home there. I know what Melissa and what she believes, and I see her here at church on Sunday mornings. But as a church, we need to help him there too. To provide him, to, to, to move him along, to, 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 to show him the steps. Speaking to the multitude who received the bread and fish in the wilderness, Jesus declared himself the bread of life. They looked for another meal. Jesus says, I can send him better. I hope today that you have made the decision to make him Lord of your life. If not, I pray that you will come forward and we can, we can pray and we can